Hey everyone, I'm Rudy. I'm the product lead for AMP at Google, and I'm also a member of AMP's technical steering committee. Today I'm here to provide you with a few uh, peeks at the future as I tell you about what's next in AMP. We've done this talk for the past few uh, years at AmpConf, and it's really thrilling to be back with you all here in Tokyo for our third edition. But this year, we thought we'd do things a little bit differently because we have the other TSC members, and they're really eager to come out here and share with you all um, their thoughts about the future of AMP as well. And so momentarily, they'll be up here on stage for the panel. But before we do that, I thought it'd be helpful if I came out and framed things up uh, for that discussion. So let's get started. Earlier today in the keynote, you heard about AMP's vision and our mission. These statements are important uh, for the project and important to us who work on the project to get aligned and have a good common sense of the North Star vision that we have and how we get there. So AMP's vision is a strong, user-first, open web that stays with us forever. I think encoded in this are the ideals of a web that benefits people and enables the freedom of expression, the exchange of ideas, and the pursuit of opportunities. Now, just as importantly, we need some basic agreement about how we're going to get there, and that's what our mission statement helps us do. We want to provide a user-first format for web content that supports the long-term success of each player in the ecosystem. Being aligned on both the vision and the mission are how we, as a technical steering committee and as a community, figure out how to do new cool things with AMP. So as you look ahead to what's next, I thought it was actually uh, you know, useful to take a look at where we were coming from. And I recognize that many of the same themes that have guided us as we get to today are also the keys to understanding how I think 2019 is going to look. To me, there's three major themes. The first is we've been exploring some new frontiers with AMP. The second, I think more than we've ever had before, we're starting to think with a long-term view about the project. This means thinking about how AMP's used as a technology that powers websites 5, 10, or even 15 years down the line. And along with this, we've also thought about how the web platform is going to evolve and how, how AMP will help lead that evolution. And finally, with all these new applications of AMP, with thinking about this long-term vision, we've also thought about how do we best accommodate you know, collaborative approaches for contribution and engagement within the project. So let's take a closer look at each of these. So to begin, I told you that last year we think was a really big one in terms of establishing some new frontiers for the AMP project. At the beginning of AMP back in 2015, our focus for AMP was on websites. We observed that the performance and usability problems that we saw across the web were pretty common, and we thought that the solutions that were needed were also pretty well established. Things like asynchronous loading of resources or you know, static declaration of image sizes so you wouldn't have content reflow. But a lot of this stuff's easier said than done. There's been lots of books and blog posts written about these sorts of things. And they're things that you just need to constantly be reinvesting time to do. And another observation we had is even as a developer, even if you get all these things right, often your experience can be affected by third party things like ads and analytics. So it was no surprise that as we moved into 2016, we found that there was another application for AMP technology that came along, uh, which was AMP for ads or AMP HTML ads. This idea that we could sort of put ad creative itself on good rails and provide a you know, format for advertising that is needed to run businesses, but that also on the user side ensures that they're going to be really user first and safe. And then at AmpConf last year, we introduced AMP for stories and AMP for emails, basically doubling the number of distinct applications for AMP that we have in the project. So all four of these things are really super exciting fronts for web-based content in the AMP. So I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about AMP for websites. But first, let me cover some updates about AMP for ads, stories, and emails. So first up, AMP HTML ads. The first thing we'd like to do with AMP HTML ads is related to coverage. We'd like to expand the number of places where AMP ads can appear. And one of the big ones that we see is within mobile apps. So there's going to be work happening in the coming year to support that. Um, and even just looking at the web, there's a bunch of ad creatives that aren't even supported yet. And so a key second theme is going to be around capabilities. This will be things like more animation support, support for gestures, and the Canvas API. And of course, as we're doing these things, we also want to work on making sure that the runtime itself is getting thinner and that the performance for AMP HTML is improving. So there's so much more to cover about the world of ads in AMP. And so I invite you to come to the lead off talk tomorrow to learn more about advertising in AMP. So next up for stories. 
You heard the talk earlier today. There's a number of rich capabilities that we want to add over the coming year. And so these include things like embeds for objects such as social posts. We even want to explore making it possible to do live updating content within a story. We also want to introduce more animation capabilities so that you have the tools you need to make uh, storytelling more engaging with motion. And stories should evoke emotion. And so we're in the early stages of planning out how it would look to enable people to do things like reactions in stories. And finally, stories may not be linear. And so we want to explore how we can include a way for storytellers to do things with branching and amp stories. You can imagine this being useful for things like quizzes or other really compelling narrative forms. And then next up for email. As the email ecosystem begins to grow, it's, it's quite nascent still. One of the themes is going to be to focus on compatibility. This is, means making sure that all the emails that are created look and behave the same way, even as they're served up in different clients. We're also exploring things like video support. We took an, the same playbook that we did with AMP initially, where we're starting with a small number of capabilities and then looking to broaden out over time as the use cases become clear. So that's true of both video as well as a whole host of other potential components that are in part of the core of AMP that we could look to bring to email as long as it makes sense and we can ensure that they're going to be safe in an email context. So we have a whole session about AMP for email on, on deck for tomorrow as well. So I encourage you to come in the afternoon to check that out. But as I said, I want to focus most of, the talk, of this talk on AMP websites. So let's dig in there. There's a lot of different things I could cover when it comes to AMP for websites. But I'm going to just call out a few for now. First, we continue to focus on e-commerce experiences for AMP. It's now possible to build almost every piece of the upper funnel uh, using uh, AMP, things like category pages as well as product detail pages. And we want to make it easier and possible to build out the payment part of AMP experiences. Um, so you can build really a full AMP-based website from the top of the funnel down. The next thing I'd call out, and this one really sticks out as an area we've gotten a ton of feedback on time and time again, and that's the 50 kilobyte limit for your CSS. So we've identified a technical approach that we think is going to work really well for solving this, and it aligns philosophically with what we're trying to do. Basically, we're going to introduce an adaptive approach to handling CSS limit. So what this means is as long as your utilization of CSS is high, then you can go beyond this limit. We think that this will improve both the developer experience as well as uh, enable us to maintain a good user experience from the AMP point of view. In addition, to build a nice, cohesive AMP-based website, we want to uh, think about how we can go from having individual pages to how we can offer nice, fluid transition bet transitions between those pages. And so we're going to be focusing on transitions as you know, a goal of how to make AMP feel more app-like as a whole. And then lastly, we want to focus more on statefulness. So continuing on from that last theme around transitions, imagine you're moving between the different pages of a site. So you could, for example, be on a filtered product listing view. And then you click and go to a detail page. Well, you know, it's quite natural as you're in this browsing mode on, a, on an e-commerce site, you might want to go back to that view that you were in before with the filtered list. But if you go back, you want to make sure that you're in the exact same state you were before. And that, so that's what we mean by bringing in statefulness. And so this is going to be an area that we work on improving in AMP in the coming uh, year as well. So much of the ongoing work for AMP websites concerns how we can best build out AMP to be a well-lit path for the most capable and performant websites on the web. We often think about this holistic idea as AMP as a service. And we have a whole talk tomorrow about this, which I encourage you to attend. It's happening at 10 AM. So why do we think about AMP as a service? Well, it really gets back to the second of those themes that I was talking about at the beginning. That's thinking about AMP in the long-term sense. So let's take a look at how we're investing in AMP and the web with a long-term view. As we've built out AMP over the last couple of years, enabling what we call AMP-first websites has been a priority. An AMP-first website is one that reflects the long-term view of using AMP. It's one where the pages, some of them, perhaps even all of them, are using AMP to deliver that core site experience. For instance, the developer website AMP.dev is an example of this. If you go to AMP.dev, it's built using AMP. AMP-first contrasts with what's often called the paired mode of using AMP. This is where you have the AMP page, but it's paired to a non-AMP version. So if you go directly to the site, you're not going to get the AMP version. This model does have some benefits. For one, it's going to be a really natural state to be in as you're taking an existing HTML page and then building an AMP version of it. It's an important model for publishing to AMP. You'll be able to experiment and get going. 
and it's one that we'll continue to support. But we increasingly hear about how the Pear Dam brings on extra development and ongoing maintenance, which of course is not the point at all. So it bears emphasizing that we think AMP first is the destination to reach. A lot of the new advancements that we're putting into AMP are about making AMP first more viable and easier for you to achieve. For instance, one of the insights we've gathered watching sites striving to go AMP first is that getting maybe 90 or even 99% of the way there is quite possible. AMP's components go a long way to unlocking the core experiences that you need, but sometimes there's that last mile that's just tough. There's something that you'll need that custom capability, the custom JavaScript to do. And so earlier, you heard the really exciting news about AMP first going to origin or AMP script going to origin trials. And so we'd like to work toward a state where you know, these kinds of use cases that come up, that's perfectly fine. You can say, I'm not blocked. I can use AMP script for that. And so some of you may remember that we were really excited to preview AMP script last year. It was a big reveal during the same talk. And you might wonder, well, what's in store for this year? Well, as I said, we see AMP script filling this role where you get that last bit of something into AMP. But what about even getting going with AMP? Can we create a better on-ramp? Well, when you use AMP today, the mindset is that you build the page and it needs to pass the AMP validator. Why is this the case? Well, AMP is like a tightly assembled engine. There's a core and there's the various web components, and we expect them to kind of put together and work together in a certain way. And the assumptions can be broken in an AMP page when it's invalid. We don't know if those pieces will work together in the way we expect. There's really no guarantees. And so this all or nothing approach to building for AMP makes for a steep entry. It's really reasonable to wonder, if I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get all the way there, should I even try? So one of the big new undertakings for AMP in the coming year is something that we're calling Bento AMP. With Bento AMP, you can pick and choose the parts of AMP that you want to use, and it'll work. You can use AMP as a web component library. So in particular, this means that the AMP components will work reliably outside of a valid AMP context. They'll also be able to interact with non-AMP components. They'll be able to interact with each other, even without the core of v0.js. And you'll be able to use them with client-side rendering frameworks. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to require quite the re-architecture of how AMP works under the hood. But it's one of the most audacious things that we have lined up for the coming year. We're just getting started, and so we're going to see if this all works out. And hopefully, we'll be able to tell you more about this at next year's AmpConf, if not sooner. We're excited about Bento AMP because it sets up this path where you can begin to use Bento AMP in your web pages, and that'll deliver these component level wins. That offers great usability, and it offers a starting point toward getting to full AMP bit by bit that you can build up toward. And over time, you can work toward getting to a place where it's a fully valid AMP uh, that gets the full advantages of AMP, like instant loading and embeddability. So Bento AMP represents an opportunity to take something that came from AMP, this rich library of web components, these things like super easy, easy to configure image carousels or light boxes, and extend it across the whole of web content. We've spent a lot of the last year, likewise, thinking about how we can take ideas cultivated in AMP and begin to figure out how they will uh, be able to be taken advantage of as web platform features. So one example of this is web packaging. It solves this idea of how can you scalably do instant loading content on the web, even across origins, while respecting a person's privacy. Well, this is a technology that will work even for non-AMP content. We're also excited about a new upcoming technology called Portals that takes this idea that something can be embeddable, as AMP is, and this is the property that we use to drive the AMP ad experience or make sure that we have AMP emails that can be secure across the web. So there's going to be a deeper dive on both of these technologies in talks tomorrow. But suffice to say that working on these things and making sure that we can bring them to the web platform uh, is going to be really relevant to the work in AMP over the coming year as well. And another area where we're working to grow out the web platform is around metrics as well. So there was a time we asked ourselves, you know, what are the core user experience uh, benefits that AMP is really trying to attain? So yeah, it's fast loading, but it's also preventing content from getting shifted around. It means making sure that content is ready for your interaction so you can tap or scroll on something and not have kind of weird jank and delay. But what we found is a lot of the metrics that exist aren't really good at capturing these user experiences that we were going for. And so there's been a lot of work going on to building out new metrics that will be able to capture these user experience benefits. OK, so the last theme for the year. 
has been around how do we set up models to contribute to the project and engage with it more effectively. So one of the big new things here has been the updated governance that we introduced last fall. We've shifted to a model where we have a technical steering committee that's responsible for setting AMP's technical and product direction. Right now, we number seven people on the TSC. So then there's also an advisory committee. It helps do the, the TSC do its job by contributing many varied and additional viewpoints to the mix. And so right now, the advisory committee is about 15 people, and they represent things from news publishers to e-commerce sites to CDNs, publishing platforms, as well as some open web advocates. But the working groups are really where it's at. We have over a dozen different working groups spanning many of the different community and technical segments of the AMP project. And this is the key place where you know, the project roadmaps are getting set, the features are getting figured out and then built out, and the work is actually happening. And you can get involved here. You can join a working group and get engaged. We'd really love to talk with you. And if you do, we had our first contributor summit this past fall. And I'm really excited to say that we're going to do the same thing this year. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to see you this fall at our next AMP contributor summit. 